celebration. It's our annual celebration for um, Martin Luther King. Um, and we are just so honored to actually have the uh, two speakers that we're going to have today, uh, Dr. Grace Luwana and Pastor um, uh, Lindsey Bell from um, the uh, church, the uh, church in um, Kalamazoo. Um, but what we want to do today is really focus on why it's important for us to do this. It's important for us to have a celebration about Martin Luther King because of what Martin Luther King stood for and actually has inspired us to continue to do his work. Um, he is the father of the civil rights. He actually stood for um, equity and justice and equity also including health care. So it's um, a privilege for us to actually have a celebration for his birthday and honor him on Monday and really to um, have an opportunity to honor organizations in our community and bring those organizations forward to um, you all in the government community. You all in the government So that you can learn more about really what these organizations have been doing, um, the work that they've been doing that honors and uh, speaks to equity and justice and equality. Um, so I'm going to stop talking because we're going to hear more about them from Dean Chamulin. But before that, I'd really like to open up our ceremony with a um, poem, an original poem created by Sierra Ward, who is a Western Michigan University student. Um, her major is public health and holistic communications is her minor. She is an extraordinary speaker and an extraordinary poet. Um, again, I can't uh, thank her enough for her willingness to come and create this poem for us in this celebration. So Sierra, I'm going to let you take it away and thank you. OK, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me OK? I'm should be set up an echo. OK, um, all righty. Um, this is a poem I put together. Like she said, I really enjoy poetry. Um, it's a way of expressing myself. And I really, um, I really like writing it, especially around um, Black History Month. If my fingers were the rhythm, if my sound was the blues, if you knew me how I knew you, would you choose to walk in my shoes? Music that rang from ancestors' cries, this movement has played for far too long. The sounds of freedom, oh, sweet, sweet freedom. Will we ever truly hear its song? See, if I was told to sing like Martin, what phrase would I be destined to say? To speak and know your voice is heard is what led his name to fame. I have a dream, said MLK. That message still remains the same. To see children all colors standing together evokes an everlasting change. While shadowing behind our ancestors, his message was made to heal. Nonviolence is a powerful weapon. Your voice is in fact what they cannot steal. Fighting to keep this hope alive, fighting to fuel this drive. You can put me down, you can count me out, but yet I still will rise. See, darkness is a thing they cannot see. Indeed, they must rely upon our lights. Drive out the hate with the love in our lives. Stay strong in our long and peaceful fights. Thank you. So Sierra, I wish you could hear everybody clapping. That was beautiful. And um, what a wonderful way to open up our celebration. And we just wanna thank you for your presence and for your gift and sharing your gift with us today. Actually, I'm like, I have chills. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people have chills in the audience too. And just before I introduce Dean Termulin, I do wanna say if Tanya can hold up, we are um, giving, I know that uh, Dr. Um, Lubuana has to leave after her talk, but we wanna let make sure that we let um, you all know that we are honoring Dr. Lubuana and the Y, as well as we are honoring Northside Ministry Alliance for their work. And we have awards that we are going to be sending to them after this um, 
presentation. If uh, actually Tanya is holding up the award, uh, one for uh, the YWCA and Dr. Lubuana for your work um, and, can, can, and the work that you've been doing in this community that's just so inspiring. And um, for Northside Ministry Alliance, Pastor Lindsey Bell, um, the vice vice president for the Northside Ministry Alliance, we have one for you as well. And we just want to just uh, thank you so much. And I'll, now it's my pleasure to introduce our Dean, uh, Paula Tunwulin. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Uh, it is such a privilege and an honor to have the opportunity to be before all of you in celebration of Dr. King. <clears throat> really, I just want to welcome everyone and 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 you know help you consider how we want to continue to celebrate our community partners who really embody the spirit of Martin Luther King. You know, in his speech, I have a dream. Dr. King called for civil and economic rights and to end racism in the United States. And, you know, over 50 years later, here we are. The need for this work continues and the, ma and the pandemic has really magnified the disparities that exist within our communities of color. And um, this work is needed so badly today as it was 50 years ago. The resilience of people who continue the fight, I think, is, is something remarkable. And it's something that we're all invited into this work. And sadly, we get reminders on a regular basis of, of why we need to intentionally engage in this work. So when I reflect on the leadership of Dr. King, you know, he continues to inspire us today. And I think it's notable that he knew he could not do this alone. Uh, he needed partners for the work, and some of those time, and sometimes those partners were found in unlikely places. Um, it's said that Dr. King pushed President Lyndon Johnson to enact the 1964 Civil Rights Bill and the 1965 Voting uh, Rights Act. <clears throat> this was not an easy partnership. Uh, I can only imagine at the time. Uh, and there were lots of good intentions and yet challenging circumstances to try to get this work done. And yet, I think the important lessons that were learned is how constructive tension can lead to meaningful work. You know, at WMED, we are actively developing a vision of how we can be a more engaged partner within our community and help to create a physician workforce that reflects and understands the people and populations we serve. Today, we get to celebrate two of our community partners who are working to alleviate suffering from racism and to create a just and equitable Kalamazoo in Southwest Michigan. You know, WMED aspires to be the best partner possible in this work. And together, we can co-create a world where everyone can live their lives to the fullest extent possible. So again, I, I just want to say what a, an honor and privilege it is uh, as the leader at, of WMED to be able to engage in this work with all of you and particularly with these two community partners. So now it is time to recognize these partners. So let me give you a little introduction about them. <clears throat> It is through their work that, of equity and equitable service in the community that, we, that they are honoring the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this year, we're glad that both the, WYC, uh, the, the WYCA and the Northside Ministerial Alliance are, were able to join us. Um, the YWCA Kalamazoo provides direct services to women, children, and families. They are on a mission to eliminate racism, empower women, stand up for social justice, help families, and strengthen communities. That's an awful lot. And they are, they are well led by Dr. Grace Labuana, who is a native of Uganda, and she has brought her broad global perspective, experience with public health, organizational leadership, and community development to the YWCA Kalamazoo. Dr. Labuana's experiences hold the organization's mission and fidelity as it addresses domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking through a racial and gender equity lens. Understanding the importance of targeting interventions for the most vulnerable, under Dr. Labuana's leadership, YWCA Kalamazoo opened the first shelter for all victims of human trafficking in the state of Michigan. I also want to acknowledge that Dr. Lubwana, we are so fortunate at WMED to have her serve as a member of our board of directors. So thank you for that, Dr. Lubwana. 
Now, the Northside Ministerial Alliance enhances relations between clergy and community leaders by bringing together its members and the public for spiritual renewal, sharing, and responding to community concerns net and networking. Uh, I've had a chance to meet a, a number of the members of the Northside Ministerial Alliance as I've been making my rounds as a new leader in our community, and it's, it's really remarkable the work that is going on. In cooperation with the public schools, local law enforcement agencies, and other agencies, the Northside Ministerial Alliance strives to strengthen families and promote a better quality of life. By working to eliminate poverty, racism, and injustice, the Alliance fosters unity, diversity, and equality in the greater Kalamazoo community. Pastor Lindsay Bell specifically has invested many years into improving the quality of life for the people in our city. He has been an active member of the Northside Ministerial Alliance for the past 21 years and currently has the honor to serve as vice president uh, for the past eight years. As vice president, he embraces the mission and vision of the Northside Ministerial Alliance. He views it as a necessity to our community and believes that it is a moral, conscious, uh, and vital it, to uh, ensuring an equitable voice is always prevalent in our community. Uh, I just you know, have to pause for a moment when we talk about voices and thinking how Sierra really called that out, that you know we can be pushed down in many ways, but you can't silence the voices. Pastor Bell believes that the local church is still the answer to most of our community problems, and he helps lead the Alliance to achieve the vision of a community living in truth and righteousness. So first, we're going to hear from Dr. Labuana on behalf of the YWCA, followed by Pastor Bell, who will share with us the work of the Northside Ministerial Alliance. So with that, Dr. Grace, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Timmerland. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Dr. Dixon. Thank you so much. And Sierra, what an amazing, amazing voice. I am honored, honored on this day, one, to serve on the board of the, of the medical school. I am honored to be one of the board members. It's such a great institution, and we're excited about Paula's leadership as we are moving forward. And I'm also honored to be honored with Pastor Bell and the Northside Ministerial Alliance. You know, they are key legacy founders of my work in Kalamazoo who believed in my work when I first showed up. So I am honored to be standing on your shoulders today as we continue to fight, as we continue to build the legacy of um, um, <clears throat> Dr. Martin Luther King, and as we continue to be the voice, as Sierra said, the voice of racial justice. You know, I, I've, I've always been saying in the last couple of years, we are in a moment in life that has never been more relevant for racial justice work. You know, we have been talking about this work for so many years. We are standing on legacy of people that have opened doors for so many people, especially people of color. And for the YWC, as we talk about race and gender equity, people have opened doors for so many people. So there has never been a time so relevant in our time to speak about this work, to be bold about racial justice and racial equity, and to bring alongside people I am getting to a point in my life where I am losing my patience for people who are just finding out on this work. And, and maybe there are other people that can support them. I am losing my patience because it calls for humanity. It calls for us to pull out and find everything that is inside of us to be humans, to lift up the voices of those people that can speak for themselves. Uh, uh, to lift up the voices of those individuals or those communities of those people that have been oppressed. It's our collective obligation. And, and I know it's been so many years. I hate for us to celebrate every year the legacy and the life of a fighter uh, for Dr. Martin Luther King, and we don't have tangible actions. So I want to call on each one of you today. Like, let's take it upon ourselves to move a stone from that mountain. This work is so important. It's so important for our community. It's so important for our children. It's so important for us that it needs to bubble from the stomach of us. It needs to bubble from all of us so that we collectively celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King with purpose and with intentionality. So I am honored, I am honored to on this day to speak about that legacy and also to lift up the work of the YWCA. The work that the YWCA has been doing 
again, I am standing on a legacy of people that have come before me and probably people that are coming ahead to really continue to be a voice in this movement. So the YWCA has been around in the United States for more than 100 years. You know, we have really been at the forefront of the racial justice movement in this country. So right now, you know, Kalamazoo is part of a, 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 a national movement. The YWC Kalamazoo is part of a national movement of other YWCAs in the country that are really focused on a movement around racial race and gender equity in the United States. So our work started, I'm going to go through a timeline. You know, I, I always tell people the YWCA has such a great legacy and I don't think we celebrate it as much as we should. The legacy, the movement around race and gender equity has really been led by the YWCA movement in the United States. And, and I think we never celebrate that work so much. So I wanna start that the work started in 1858 that is when the first YWCA opened in New York as the Ladies of the Christian Association. So they opened uh, in New York City, that was in 1858. And really the purpose was how do we elevate the, the women's movement? How do we work to support women as they were getting into the workforce? So in 1885, the YWCA Kalamazoo was then opened. So it was founded by Ida Sen. So it was opened here in Kalamazoo. That was in 1885. Then four years later, Dayton, Ohio became a home for the first African-American launch. So that's when the YWCA movement launched the first African-American YWCA in the United States. Uh, then in 1890, one year after the first African-American branch opened in Dayton, Ohio, YWCA opened its first student chapter for indigenous women in, in Oklahoma. So you can see within our movement, we've really been intentional. Have we been a perfect organization? Probably not. But there has been an intentionality within the movement, within the gender equity movement, to make sure that we are bringing alongside all the women, all women of color to be part of, to be part of this movement. Then during that time, the YWCA brand also began to grow nationally, leading to seven chapters opening at historical black colleges and university. As again, talking about um, the movement, the women's movement. And then around 1910, 57 YWCA branches opened to assist immigrant undocumented women. I don't know if people know a lot of the history of the YWCAs around the country and the work that they did around immigration reform so many years ago, really supporting immigrant women as we're coming into United States. Then in 1911, one year later, YWCA began offering bilingual instructions for immigrants, for immigrants' families and, and women in their communities. And then around 1912, uh, YWCA in, in New Jersey was established and it was the first black YWCA in America not affiliated with a YWCA. So most of the original YWCA that started were very segregated. But we started to realize within our movement for a collective voice around race and gender equity, we had to make sure, and that's why our mission is about eliminating racism. We had to make sure we had the voices of all women of color in this movement. So around 1946, the YWCA passes the interracial chapter and under the leadership of Dorothy Ironheart, we began the work of racial justice education, desegregation, YWCA across the country at that level of all the organization. So around that time, that's when the work began within the YWCA movement. That is when our mission of eliminating racism and empowering women became a real purpose because we were on a journey of racial justice and we wanted to make sure that within the YWCA movement, we removed all the structures that we are creating systematic racism and creating barriers within our own movement. So uh, in 1970, that is when the YWCA's uh, collective power talked about taking on the eliminating racism into our YWCA mission. This was very, very intentional in 1970 within our collective movement around, the, uh, around YWCA in the United States to ensure that eliminating racism was a bold statement within the movement. So that before we talk about the women's movement, we wanted to make sure that we dismantle racism 
in a collective movement. And once we dismantled racism, then we would know that collectively we'll be moving all the women together, all different identi gender identities together. Uh, in 19, I want to talk about in 1992, that's when collectively around the country, we really started to get into more national movements around injustices. That is when the um, Rodney King trial happened. We collectively rallied people around the country to make sure that the collective movement was really speaking about injustices that were happening around the country. And that work has continued. It has continued to happen um, around different communities. We are around 200 communities in, I mean, 2,000 uh, YWC associations in, in the United States. And that work from a local perspective has continued and continued and continued to do that. Around 2015, we made a commitment. We made a commitment as an organization, as a movement, to be bold and adopted the Stand Against Racism campaign. This is a campaign that we launch every year uh, within our local communities and, and really speak and boldly talk about the injustices. And we have chosen as a movement to be bold and not to be shy when we speak about anti-racism work or when we speak about inequalities that exist that impact the, the people of color in the communities that we serve. So that speaks broadly of the movement that we have. It's so unfortunate we haven't done a good job speaking about the legacy of the YWCA's around the country and the legacy of the YWCA in Michigan, in Kalamazoo, the YWCA in Kalamazoo was the first YWCA in the state of Michigan. So that speaks to our community, that speaks to our local community, the power, the power of women, the power of people of color in Kalamazoo, the power of our community to really be intentional about social justice and how we do our work. So building on that history, where we are here at the YWCA Kalamazoo still standing bold, we have never been more intentional and bold about our mission and not shying away from saying, yes, we will stop doing what we do until we have eliminated racism and all people are empowered and all communities are empowered. So we are moving forward, boldly speaking about that and calling on everyone to be part of what we do. So we have really been intentional on how we design the strategic work of the YWCA and how we engage in the work that we do. You know, our work is just simply in four strategic focus areas and is driven by a social justice legacy and really intentional in, in addressing disparities across the different social determinants of health within our own community. So I'm, I'm just going to be brief. I, I hope that all most of the people that are on the call kind of know the work that we do at the YWCA. Brianna, is there a next slide to that or that's the last one? That one's the last one. OK, so I'll speak through that. So, you know, we walk through in, uh, improving the lives of children. And we know as we talk about eliminating racism and empowering women, the data has been very, very clear. You know, living in the pandemic, it's very, very clear on how we need to support families, how we need to support essential workers, how to need how we need to support and be intentional on supporting communities that are majority people of color. So having a children's center has been one of the points that we have used within our work. We opened last year the first comprehensive 24 hour child care center in the state of Michigan. What that means, we are open 24 hours for families. We provide the traditional child care uh, services, the uh, six to six, and then we do shifts for families that are working night shift, first, second and third shift. We also do a drop in. So if families have to go do something, you have a court hearing, you have to be somewhere. We have within our Kalamazoo community, uh, a facility that can accommodate families 24 hours, Monday to Friday. So we, we are very, very excited that we launched that program last year, again, embedded in a racial justice lens, being sensitive to hearing what the community is telling us and asking us to do. The other work that we've done, that we've done for a long time, is a caring for victims of abuse, a domestic violence shelter, human trafficking shelter, you know, a sexual assault program, 
uh, legal services to all survivors of abuse, all survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault and human trafficking. We have been for the last years been very, very intentional on how we partner with the criminal justice system, how we raise the voices of the clients that come to us, the survivors of abuse, and, and how being intentional in our racial justice movement, how we elevate those voices and change our systems and change our internal systems so that when any survivor comes to the doors of the YWCA's or comes to receive services at the YWCA, they are treated with dignity so that it doesn't matter what community they're coming from, the color of their skin, but treated with dignity and making sure that their well-being and their family well-being is taken care of. We also added through the Credo Al Kalamazoo Initiative an intentional program that really focuses on women of color, especially black women. We know the disparities that exist around infant mortality, the disparities that exist around mortality for black mothers. So there was an intentionality for us as an organization that focuses on eliminating racism and empowering women to be intentional on having a program, a home visitation program that supports parents, that supports mothers, that supports pregnant parents, that supports parents that have children and the end goal is to ensure that we reduce the infant mortality disparities that unfortunately exist in our Kalamazoo community, especially for our black babies. We are excited to be part of the Credo Kalamazoo initiative with the other partners, the Northside Ministerial uh, Alliance is part of that work. WMED has been a strong partner in that work and the work has not come to an end. We are still continuing until every baby in our community, especially our black babies, survive and celebrate their first birthday. So our commitment to do that work. We continue also as an agency to be an advocacy for change. Eliminating racism, systematic racism, injustice in our community will end when we collectively raise our voices on behalf of everyone and speak truth to what is happening and be intentional and, and, and be action oriented to the injustice. We can lie ourselves as a community and say, no, in Kalamazoo, we are doing well. The reality, we are not. We wanna make sure the violence that we're hearing in our own community, the disparities that we're hearing in our own schools, the data speaks it very clearly. Until we shift as a community, until those numbers shift in our community and we close the disparities that exist between white and families of color in Kalamazoo, then the work cannot end. And I think that on as what Martin Luther King's legacy was, is calling us to be service in our community. You know, I love when they talk about the services, the, the service days and the call for volunteering to volunteer with nonprofit organizations and faith-based organizations. But I think honoring the life of a fighter, honoring the life of Martin Luther King every year, we have to be intentional. It takes all of us. It takes not one agency, but it takes the collective of all of us. I tell people that the work around racial justice does not end in the office. For us at the YWCA, it does not end at the YWCA. When I'm a mother to my two boys, when I'm walking in the community, it is my responsibility to ensure that everyone, especially the most vulnerable in our community, their voices are heard. So I want to call on each one of you today as we celebrate Martin Luther King's honor every year, a call to service, a personal call to be a service in your community. Get your antennas on there because the reality, the work is not yet done. The work will be done when every child when every family, when everyone in Kalamazoo is valued, their voice is heard. That is when the work is heard. We can put on all kinds of events every year. We can celebrate. We can give all kinds of things. But until we do our personal work and lift up those antennas for our community, for each one of us. You know, I am fortunate, born and raised in Uganda and Africa, in the African community. Every child in your village is your child. It doesn't matter if you're, you're biological or not you're biological. We got to raise those antennas for our community and let the legacy of Martin Luther King be real and be personal for our work. 
So I am honored to be here with all of you and thank you for giving me time. I do not like the Zoom and virtual things. I always want to be with people because I feel like I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> I don't see all the people I feel like I'm speaking to myself. So I will pause and see if people have any questions for me. Jack, I see your hand up. That's the only one I see. <laughs> good, good afternoon, Grace. Uh, that was a very inspiring talk. As, as a leader in our community for racial. I think Jack Frost. Things that you think uh, the medical students and the employees of the medical school can do uh, to support a lot of the pioneering efforts that, you know, you're putting forward. Uh, it, what kind of special charge do you think the, the medical school should uh, try and take on in supporting this important work. You know, thank God when we celebrate the Martin Luther Day, it's a call to service in your community. That's a national call to service in your community. When we live in this community, the community becomes our home. And I want to call on people. The reality is, even in Kalamazoo, we do have families, we do have communities that are vulnerable. And until we reach out, I want to call on medical students, the staff of, of, um, of medical school. And I always tell people when we want to volunteer, let's not commit to too much. Jack, if you say for 2022, I am going to give eight hours of volunteering. I'll use the YWC as an example. I will give eight hours for 2022 to volunteer at the YWCA. And when I'm there, I want to make sure that I, I impart everything that I have, whether it's a child, whether it's lifting up something, because the reality is, and especially for the work that we do at the YWCA, you never know. You might never see those families again. So imagine if all of us on this call gave eight hours for 2022, eight hours collectively, that's a lot of time. And we do it with all our strength and impacting and knowing that when we touch the lives of people, there is no guarantee that we are going to see them again. So in those moments when we volunteer, when we commit our time, that's why I say the mountain is so big. But if each one of us lifted a stone off that mountain, we will eventually get the mountain down. So it takes all of us to lift that stone and give it our all and knowing and being sensitive to what's happening in our community. We are so good, you know, WMED has a great building. Not everybody has a great building. Sometimes when we are in those spaces, we forget what's around us. But getting out of those good buildings and going around, visit all the different components of our community. Let's get to hear the passion, the, the, the voices of people, the things that other families enjoy that we may not enjoy. So I wanna encourage each one of you on this call. Think of 2022. Let the service and the celebration, the legacy of Martin Luther, make your own legacy of Martin Luther King. Volunteer whatever that time means, one hour, 2022. 20, and when you give that one hour, give it with all your strength and impact the lives of those individuals. Any other questions? I don't see people, please just speak up because I can't see hands raised. OK, Dr. Dixon, I don't think I have any questions. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being a partner in this work uh, and your leadership. I really, I really appreciate for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Great. Grace, you are, you, you actually, when you speak, it's actually touches my heart and I'm sure everyone, you see them clapping. I'm pretty sure everybody in this audience, a uh, hundred more are actually clapping for you and inspired. If they're not inspired by what you've just said to actually call, you know, call to serve, I don't know what can inspire people because honestly, um, I've got chills again um, for your, you know, just for you, Grace, and what you're doing and how you actually touch our hearts um, and touch our hearts in the way that we need to be touched. So everyone, the message is clear. 
the message is clear. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions for um, Dr. Luana later, are, are you okay with people connecting with you, bringing yes. up questions at another time? Yes, please. Yes, please. I see a lot of road blazers. Stephanie, I see you. I see so many people. You know, we are all in the fight for this work. So I want to thank everyone and thank for the opportunity and for all of you who are doing this work. This work doesn't end. It's emotional for some of us. And I, I just want to be grateful for all the people, the colleagues that are fighting every day on the front lines, that are speaking up, that are raising their voices. It's unfortunately we are not there. I hope we'll get there someday. <laughs> Let's keep hoping. Just like you said, if everyone does eight hours and all of eight hours, just imagine what you can get done. So we are yeah, all well, together. Yeah. I Thanks. know it doesn't end, but but for all of you, for all the colleagues that are out there that I cannot see that are fighting every day, I appreciate you. I see you and let's keep fighting. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep fighting until yep. everyone celebrates this day. Thank you so much again, Dr. Lubwana. Thank you so much. We've been graced by your grace. <laughs> thank, thank you. you so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I think well, Dean, uh, Dean Tremulin, do you want to say cool. something? Wanna... No, I'm just taking it all in. It's all yours, Cheryl. OK, so um, again, if you all have questions and you haven't been able to like um, answer, you know, ask any questions, Dr. Buana and the Y um, right around the corner from us, and you can actually connect with them, serve with them. There's lots of programs she's talked about, you know, the Child Care Center, all those programs. So the invitation is there. Thank you so much. I'm full. Um, so we have next uh, Pastor Lindsay Bell from the Northside Ministry Alliance. And again, I'm pretty much going to probably be crying after he speaks too. <laughs> but Pastor Bell, um, if you would uh, actually now take 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 the mic, um, and it's your now your turn to talk about the work um, as it continues with the Northside Ministry Alliance. We are blessed by your presence. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dixon, for this opportunity, and thank you, um, Dean Termalin, and uh, the organizers of this program. Uh, and our president, uh, Reverend Dr. Addis Moore, for giving me the opportunity to speak on his behalf. Um, and um, well, you know, when you invite preachers, that's what we do, we preach. So um, Dr. Lubama was my praise team. She warmed up the audience. So a lot of what she said, uh, you may hear in my presentation. And so, um, in, in trying to bring together a program or a presentation for this event, um, I always go to the word of God. I'm a preacher and that's what we do. And uh, I was led to Amos chapter five, verse 24. It says, let justice roll down like a river and righteousness as a mighty stream. And thinking about that, uh, I received a theme uh, to share with you all today. Uh, momentum, the energy needed to eradicate racism. A lot of what Dr. Uh, Grace was talking about was how can we dismantle racism? And so that's what we're doing with the Northside Minister Alliance. And throughout this presentation, you will hear the various things that we are doing to uh, deal with this issue of racism in our a momentum is described as a drive, an energy, more motion, a force, power. Momentum doesn't happen on its own. Uh, it's a, a source of energy that initiates it. Uh, you see it in sports. One team in basketball is down by 20 points. And before you know it, momentum shifts and they don't seem to be able to miss a shot. And within four minutes, they're winning the game, uh, like Jordan, fourth quarter in 1992, or Tom Brady in any game, trailing by a touchdown. All he needs is 30 seconds, and he has the momentum. But racism gets in the way of our vision for the Northside Ministerial Alliance. So our goal is to get rid of racism, but it takes a lifetime, not just a day. And our vision is a community living together in truth and righteousness. There are obstacles to stop us from coming together and being intentional 
about uh, addressing these issues and coming up with solutions to deal with the problem. Uh, when we are all on the same page, it creates momentum, the force to propel us further ahead in spite of the negative rhetoric that seeks to curtail our efforts. Amos 3 and 3 says, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? And the Northside Minister Alliance has worked very hard over the years to develop relationships in every area of our community. We reach out across denominational lines, political lines, educational, public safety and judicial lines, corporate and healthcare lines. We have become a place where everyone is respected and encouraged to meet together, leading change in the community through the unified church. That's our mission. We have been intentional in sitting down in each other's experience to better understand and value each other from the different cultures and backgrounds that we all come from. And once we find out what's going on in a different part of the community, it makes it easier to be more tolerant of each other. When we see the truth, we begin to see each other as equals, and it becomes easier to change the policies and practices that marginalize specific groups ethnically and economically. But we all want the same thing, a good education for our children, clean water to drink, a place to call home, opportunity to find a job to provide for our families that brings a sense of pride and dignity to every person. And once we see firsthand each other's dilemma, we'll stop having party loyalty and operate with moral authority. Last January 6, when our capital was attacked, one of my neighbors said to me, hey, Lindsay, that's not my uh, Republican party. I don't identify with them. But I told him, then you need to call your senator and congressman and let them know that's not how you want your party to be represented and you don't support the issues that they are marching on. You see, evil triumphs when good men and women do nothing. We can't ignore the truth, no matter how many times we hear political rhetoric. Now, it was wrong a few years ago when President Obama was in office uh, for Mitch McConnell to uh, prevent him from appointing Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. It was an eight month vacancy. He had the power to do the moral thing, but he was paralyzed by party loyalty. But when Justice Ginsburg died just a few months before the election, he didn't hesitate. That's hypocritical. Now the text says, let justice roll down like a river and righteousness as a mighty stream. That's how you produce momentum. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation or a community, but sin is a reproach to any people. And when men follow righteousness, it builds momentum. And the more we let our light shine, it grows stronger and stronger. Uh, yesterday, the presenter in our City League workshop said, an individual may be able to run fast, but when we operate together, we can go farther. We built that type of momentum in the Northside Ministerial Alliance. To address gun violence, we partnered with Isaac, KDPS, the prosecutor's office, and the city manager to form a group violence intervention, GVI. To address infant mortality, we did what we were good at as ministers. We did what we were good at in our own individual spaces, but we needed some momentum. And God sent us Grace, Grace Labama, the director of the YWCA, to help us mobilize and create Cradle Kalamazoo. When COVID hit hard in our community and was being left out, we contacted the health department because we had relationships and we set up four vaccine distributions within the church. It helped families at the Fox Ridge that were recently burned out in their apartments. We helped with the Flint water crisis a few years ago. We were helping with housing redevelopment, community health forms and the carnival for kids. We wanted to see the smiles on kids' face uh, for a change in their community where everything else negative is going on. Because we, we were able to do this, do this because we already had forged and developed those relationships and built the momentum with the right people. It made it easier for people to respond because they knew what our agenda was and it was part of their agenda. They saw the value and benefit for Kalamazoo. 
Now we're celebrating the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a man who stood for justice, sacrificed his life to get the voting rights and civil rights legislations passed in the 60s. But now the Senate is poised to strike down a bill that they endorsed over 20 years ago, the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill. Now that ensures safe, fair, and accessible elections where every vote counts. They made this a partisan issue, but everybody wants to have fair elections, right? But you can hear the talking points, election frauds, stop the steal, voter IDs, but none of these were issues in the election. Now they will attend MLK programs, uh, go to ceremonies and honor a man that died to secure the right to vote, but still refuse to pass a bill doing just that. Now that's disrespectful. Now we need momentum, as Dr. Obama said, to eradicate racism. So call your senators and tell them, don't shame my party if you are a Republican. Don't shame my party if you are a Democrat by not voting for this bill. Our Christians and brothers and sisters who I know and love deserve the basic right to vote. Now we sat in their experience, we know them by name and they want good things for their families just like ours. And so we've got to eliminate these barriers that prevent us from living together in truth and righteousness. And when righteous stands, momentum builds. Trust grows, obstacles are removed. And we serve a God who has the power to move any obstacles. He said, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. He's the one that can remove any obstacle that we are facing. So our people, when they were marching for freedom years ago, they weren't looking at the obstacles, the obstacles of Jim Crow, the obstacles of water hoses and dogs and lynchings and church bombings. They weren't looking at the obstacles of armed mobs threatening them if they voted or registered to vote. These were just obstacles. No, they look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And they were able to call forth things into being as though they already were. And they sang a song, we shall, overcome. That's a statement of faith. If in my heart I do believe we shall overcome someday. They didn't look at the obstacles. No, they pressed toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And brothers and sisters across this nation, black and white, uh, Jew and Gentile, every ethnic group mobilized together to support those efforts. And that momentum of faith was able to knock down those obstacles. We have that same momentum today. And I declare today that racism will not win because I won't let it win. I'll do all within my power with all that's within my, within my being to make sure it doesn't win. Bronson and Borges won't let it win. W. Med won't let it win. The city and county government of Kalamazoo won't let racism win. The school systems won't let racism win. Good police officers, deputies, and sheriffs will not let racism win. Bankers and accountants will not let racism win. They'll be fair and equitable when individuals are coming for a loan because they see the momentum of God pushing, empowering, and propelling us to a brighter future. And we will see this community living together in truth and righteousness. Our momentum will build. And the momentum of justice, righteousness, cannot be stopped. And as they sang a long time ago, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on marching, keep on walking, marching up the freedom land. I don't know about you, but I've got momentum today, Dr. Dixon. And I thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to share. God bless you. <laughs> Okay, so I actually am crying. I knew that would happen. Um, Mr. Bell, thank you so much. Honestly, um, Grace walked us through um, service and inspiration and momentum, and, and you brought it home, Pastor Bell. Um, thank you for your work. Um, thank you for you um, in this community. You're an inspiration 
and your leadership is something we can, we all need to emulate and join together with you. So it is an honor for us to have you here today, and it's an honor uh, for us to be able to work with you and North Northside Ministry Alliance and to actually work in this community. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to make sure that people have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, anybody um, wants to ask any questions for Pastor Bell? Um, Please feel free to do so. I see uh, um, Stephanie Williams um, with your beautiful red. <laughs> do you have anything you would like to say? To God be the glory. So thank you and congratulations, Pastor Bill, the Northside Minister Alliance. We continue to see the impact uh, that the Alliance has on our community as a whole. I am definitely grateful for the message that you brought today. And it's personal. It's personal in terms of what God has called us to do and you challenging us to answer that call, especially when it comes to voting rights, where now this John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act bill uh, is, is, is just sitting there where our voting rights are in question. And anytime uh, we are threatened, uh, our, our, our rights are threatened in one way, it's a threat to us in all ways. And so uh, I know with the spirit of God through you, through other leaders and members of this community, we're going to band together. We're going to do this work. Um, and I want to thank Debbie Med for having a vision, you, Dr. Cheryl Dixon, uh, for having the insight of bringing us all together around powerful messages uh, to not just talk about the issues, but even what the spirit of the Lord is doing through all of us. So thank you. Pastor Bill, you preached, you preached, you preached. Uh, I couldn't even sit here and work. I had to tune in to you. So um, I appreciate you. Dr. Dixon, you're doing an amazing, amazing job. I'm so, so empowered and enlightened. And thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie um, Williams. And uh, thank you all who are attending today. If you have questions, uh, uh, comments, or anything you want to share with Pastor Bill, we have some time. Uh, Pastor Bill, I can look at the, um, if you can't see it, I can see the people. If anybody's raising their hand or, don't be shy. <laughs> and I do want to say, um, I do want to appreciate um, Mothers of Hope. Uh, that's another organization that we collaborate with um, and the work that uh, Stephanie is doing is outstanding uh, in eradicating racism, uh, helping eliminate poverty. Um, this is our, our own sister soldier, our, our own Harriet Tubman. <laughs> okay. And uh, she, she is not shy from doing any type of work. And so we pre appreciate what uh, she does. And she's got her bodyguard right there too. So, <laughs> Uh, and uh, as she has indicated, um, Dr. Dixon, it's, it's very important that individuals like you um, are placed at WMAN because you get to bring our view, as I shared in my message, uh, you get to represent us and you, you, you develop relationship with individuals where they sit in your experience. And so when they hear the rhetoric going on, they're like, that's not my friend, Dr. Dixon. She doesn't think that way. And that's how we dismantle racism, one personal relationship at a time. And when people can see us as individuals, uh, yes. like the movie, the way they see us, if they can see us the way we see them and yes. sit in our experiences, when they, even when they hear those negative uh, talking points about this the uh, John Lewis voting rights uh, legislation that is going to allow uh, for voter fraud and uh, stealing elections. Well, uh, I, I know I only had 20 minutes in the presentation, so I couldn't put everything in it. When we see 35 states across this nation passing anti voting rights uh, measures, they are aimed at marginalizing the vote when they are gerrymandering and, and changing those lines, 
even when you have strong voting districts and vote voting blocks, it will nullify them because we won't have a representative from that district any longer. So that sounds like trying to steal an election. That sounds like election fraud to me, and they're doing it publicly. So I, I think we need to uh, really um, listen and uh, with the third uh, ear, as uh, Joe Madison says, and he's been on a hunger strike uh, for over 60 something days um, because he's, he believes this is how serious the voting rights uh, bill is. And if we pass it at the federal level, then the states won't be able to enact all of these things. Uh, that's why we have to celebrate something like Juneteenth now, because when slavery was abolished, there was still people in Texas who didn't know anything about it because federally they weren't allowed to get that information. And so this is why it's important that we have this federal mandate uh, to get away from, I mean, to protect the rights of, of all citizens. And ironically, uh, several years consistently, Republican presidents, Republican senators voted to support all type of voting rights measures. But now in the recent times, it's not the same type of Senate. And so we, we or House. So we've got to really uh, call on our brothers and sisters that yeah. see us the way they see themselves and call their congressmen and their senators because they won't move until you push them. Uh, because corporate America has bought most of them out and uh, they're not definitely, they're definitely not representing our best interests. So thank you again, Pastor Bell. Um, again, the message is out there for us, uh, service um, and actually advocate, advocate advocacy for um, what we are just talking about so that everyone still retains the right to vote. So thank you so much, Pastor Bell. Um, I do want to take a moment to have our um, group, our lead student leadership group, the SNMA, um, Francine Thoreau Gray and Wyla Isaac to talk about what the history is for SNMA and what we're doing here at the medical school. Um, we also have student volunteers. They do active citizenship in many organizations and really um, they have embraced Kalamazoo as their community and um, they actually are in this fight actually to make things better as well. So thank you students for your work. Uh, and your service and, and and the momentum that you can actually continue to bring and your presence here in this in this community. So I now take the minute to have um, Francine, uh, if you're here, and Willow to talk a little bit about SNMA. Uh, Francine, are you here? Or Willow? Perfect. Okay. Willow, Willow, sorry. Can you hear me, Willow? His mic is muted. Yeah, your mic is muted. We can't hear you, Willow. Are you having some issues with trying to connect? I'm a, probably you're having a problem. Uh, Francine, are you here or Willow? Okay, well, we're trying to get the techni technology issues. Um, try to log in and try to, I just want to, again, uh, thank everyone and the QR code for um, the, uh, w, the MedU credit is in actually in the chat if you didn't get it. Uh, for students, we weren't able to get a CE or CME credit, but um, thank you all for coming. Anyway, it's important to come even if you can't get the credit. This was like, very, very powerful, um, both our speakers. It is recorded, so it will be something that we can listen to again later. Um, and again, that the Sierra Ward, if you missed her poem, I've asked for her also to allow us to have a copy of that poem so that we can post it because it was just so beautiful as an opening for our program. 
Um, and Pastor, we will be sending you the award, you know, that we showed earlier for NMA and the work that, you know, you you and Pastor Moore continue to do, lead us. Um, and we will be sending or uh, giving that award to you um, after this presentation. We will make Thank sure you that very much. Thank <laughs> it's our honor. So, Willow, are you able to um, log in? Yeah, I think she was still having technical issues, so I will um, post the QR code for everyone to see. Perfect. Um, and then she should be on in a moment. OK, thank you, Tanya. Oh, and actually, I'm glad that Tanya just came in because this program was uh, uh, put together with really the help of Tanya and Candace. So Tanya Mitchell, the work that you've done, I want to thank you for um, helping to pull all the pieces together to actually have this happen um, without your uh, hard work and dedication and organization. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And also Candace Moore. No problem. <laughs> And also Candace Moore, who works in our, with us as well. Thank you for your your consistent help as well and work. But Tanya, oh here, thank you. This is the QR code for you all um, for uh, Medju credit, and we will also um, is posted in the chat. I think there's another number that goes with it for the pin number. And if Willow is having trouble, um, I'm here. Oh, hi. Oh, Francine, great. So maybe you can talk about SNMA because she was having trouble connecting. Yeah, yeah, um, oh. I, I totally can. OK, perfect. So everyone, this is Francine Thoreau Gray. She's actually one of the co-chairs of the Student National Medical Association. So we're happy to have them to also speak about that organization and the work that parallels um, Martin Luther King. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I think uh, Ms. Tanya had slides um, for us to present. Yes, I'm um, Okay, thank you. And in the meantime, hopefully Willow can um, come back. Also, um, thank you all for um, coming for the celebration. And um, Willow and I are the co-presidents of this year's chapter for the Student National Medical Association. Um, could you please switch to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so SNMA was founded in 1964 as a subdivision National Medical Association. Um, eventually it became an independent nonprofit corporation and its founding chapters are, were in Meharry and Howard University College of Medicine. Right now, um, we're proud to say that it is the oldest and largest independent student-run organization for underrepresented minority medical students. There's one over 150 chapters, um, and within each chapter, there are 10 regions who there is a director in charge of that. Um, Within the program, the uh, each chapter is urged to promote um, more recruitment, especially for undergrads who want to go to the pre-med route, um, more mentorship, um, and more opportunities to shine in conferences, which are nationally led. And there, are, um, um, the program has provided a platform for pipeline programs. Next slide, please. So um, it's missing our mission statement and um, SNMA's uh, national mission statement is to support um, current and future underrepresented and minority medical students, address the needs of underserved communities and increase the number of clinically excellent, culturally competent and socially conscious physicians. Um, Right, represent, we all know, we, we all know representation matters. Um, and for me to just speak candidly of an experience, one of the most um, sort of um, instrumental experiences that I've had, which helped, which sort of allowed me to choose this route of medicine was having um, a black physician a black uh, pediatrician who took care of me 
and kind of seeing her be where she is, that she could do it, was a reminder that I can do it as well. Um, and so SNMA has that vision for to promote more um, diversity within the medical field and to inspire students and future uh, physicians to remind them that, hey, we can do it and you have a chance. Next slide, please. So um, our, the SMA chapter at WMED, we are a relatively new chapter. We finally got our um, official, um, I, yeah, well, we finally became a chapter last year. So this is year two. Um, and our goals are to serve the community, um, to provide network opportunities, to bring light to issues concerning minority groups, and to provide a voice to minority students. Um, Last year, we were able to do some events uh, despite um, COVID. Um, we did a welcome event. We did a fall conversation cafe, which served as an affinity group for students within um, WMED. So we had upperclassmen who are currently in rotation come in and share about their experiences and kind of gives give us hope and advice and how to um, overcome adversity within the preclinical years and once we get to clinical years. And we were also a part of the pre-medical -med panel at Western Michigan. Uh, next slide. So our, one of our setbacks is that it is still a fairly new chapter. And with each um, event, we're trying to recruit more members um, to be a part of this community. Um, and with the COVID restrictions, it's just been difficult to attend what um, all these in-person um, events that SNMA has, um, national events, conferences, like the National Leader um, Leadership Institution, which is supposed to happen next um, week, but it's virtual. And then there's another one happening in April, but that still doesn't, that's not gonna stop us. COVID isn't gonna stop us. We're gonna still try to be engaged in all these programs, but our future goal is to expand our chapter members and have a couple more events before we switch off our leadership. Um, we want next month to be able to sponsor a Black History Month celebration. Um, in a couple of weeks time, we're teaming up with another um, uh, interest group. I I'm, Juliana, she's here. I'm gonna butcher the name. Um, it's a leadership interest group um, to provide a, a discussion about how to make space and take space. And we wanna have another um, affinity um, group uh, called the Spring Conversation Cafe so that we could all meet up with um, students and despite if you're a first year or fourth year just to talk about struggles that we've had and tools in which we could support each other and I think that's it well, thank you Francine and thank you um oh there you are thank you Willow <laughs> sorry Dr. Dixon I um I was having some technical issues and um I just want to say that uh, we're also open to any suggestions from the students, faculty, and anyone else. If, if there's any topics that you would like us to cover, we, would, we are open to it. And and sorry again, uh, no I just have issues. Technology, it's technology. We all live, lived with it and we all have grace with it. We understand. So thank you. We're glad that we could see you. And Francine, thank you so much. And so, um, Again, they've actually given you a, um, a little background about the history of SNMA um, and how much that has actually helped physicians of color. Um, and also thank you, Francine, for saying pediatrician. <laughs> so yes, we actually, um, you were inspired by a pediatrician. I didn't know that, and that's wonderful. So anyway, going forward, um, any, if you all have any questions for our speakers, I wanna thank again, Pastor, Bell. Tomorrow is the um, official program for uh, Martin Luther King celebration at um, the Mount Zion Church. Is that going to be virtual, Pastor, or is that um, in person and in virtual? Yeah, that's going to be Tuesday. 
Sunday. Is it in person or? Uh, there's some in person, but but it's going to be virtual. There will be some uh, seats available in person. Okay. Um, is, and, and if we can't have that, I do have that flyer. So I will actually send that flyer out to everyone. It's always a wonderful celebration. Um, and that's on Sunday. Um, the keynote speaker is um, Beth Washington from uh, Bronson. She is the vice president for um, commute health, health equity for the Bronson systems. So she's a wonderful speaker and she's the keynote this year for um, the, uh, the King celebration. Well, somebody. Any anything else you want to share about that, Pastor Bell, for on Sunday's presentation? Uh, no, I was just going to say it's um, the it'll be uh, January the sixteenth at four o'clock p.m. And uh, the theme again: eradicating the impact of racism. It takes a life, not just a day. And so a lot of people, you know, think that because they participate in a in a function like this, uh, that they've done their part, they've done their share in eradicating racism. But it takes a, a lifetime. And when you uh, the goal is for you to hear information and and embrace that information as the truth and then let that truth cause you to respond. Normally, when you hear the truth you respond. When you know the stove is hot, you don't touch a hot stove because that's the truth. And so uh, we have to be ready. Uh, pivot is the word I'm using uh, throughout this year uh, at our church. And we have to be ready to pivot. And sometimes you're pivoting against the grain, against your own belief systems, against traditions and years and years of practices. But that's how we were able to become free. Uh, we had to keep pushing and it took changing the hearts and we can't do it. God does the changing of the heart, transforming. So uh, we need people to not only just believe the truth, but now begin to walk in it. And like I say, show some action. Uh, evil only triumphs when good people sit by and do nothing. And we can't afford to uh, continue to have our country as a whole put in paralysis like that because it's dangerous for the country. And we're forgetting that the world sees us now. Everybody has these phones, these devices, and they can see exactly. And we're exposing weaknesses and what's supposed to be the superpower. So we've got to, we've got to straighten up and fly right, as they said back then today. Thank you again, Pastor Bell, and it actually is in the chat, the flyer um, for Sunday's service. So mm -hmm. please try to attend virtually or in person. And thank you all for attending today. Um, and we are so honored. We are all so blessed by what we were able to hear from our speakers. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Bell from the Northside Ministry Alliance, again for the work, and Dr. Grace Lubuana from the YWCA. And again, I do want to also talk about the WMED Volunteers program that we have. Um, and, you know, the message that Grace said, if everyone just does, does eight hours, just think what you could do. And we actually have that program in place. So eight hours is something that, you know, everyone can um, get time for. It's actually an end. You know, there are all our organizations that have volunteer opportunities. So please take advantage of the WMED Volunteers program and um, let's serve. And let's not just, you know, serve that one time, but serve whenever we can. Um, it's all on us to continue the momentum. So thank you everyone for today. Bless you all. See you on the 16th. Thank you. I'd like to get an opportunity to speak to that student organization as well. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, um, uh, Willow and um, Francine. You want to speak to them now or? No, no, no. This is kind of okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you come to I mean, I'm we could talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I used to work with uh, students at Western in, in retention <laughs> units. So I just like to sit down and see what you guys are doing and see if I can offer some some of my old school methods uh, 
see if they still work on 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 you uh, generation Xers. That would be amazing. That would be yeah. we anticipate your advice, wisdom. <laughs> well, I don't know what I'm going to bring, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Let me grab. I think I met you before. I, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll get we'll get connected. Uh, Doctor okay. Dixon will get us together. For sure. For sure. All Thank right. You. And we'll invite you for these conversations too. This is great. Yeah. Thank you, well, thank you again, everyone. And have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you serving in the community. I know the students are out there. Continue to do your work. Um, and uh, WMED staff, faculty, it's, it's on us also to actually get out there and partner with our community. So thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you. Okay.